our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not in temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Welcome to uh, the Pleasant Hill campus. For those who attend here every week, welcome. And for those who are guests, welcome. For those who are from Ankeny, uh, welcome. We're glad you're all here. Um, maybe, I was just standing there thinking, maybe what we ought to do is we don't hear from me. We just keep worshiping. <laughs> yeah. Um, which you can do even without music, by the way. Um, I was just saying to the Lord, God, forgive me that I don't worship you enough. Forgive me that I pray for stupid things. And Lord, please forgive me for praying for um, things that are really important to me, but they mean nothing to anybody else. Trivial things and um, when maybe, maybe the bulk of my prayer time ought to be just this, just thank you. Just thank you. That's it. Don't ask for a thing. Um, well, um, you probably learned the Lord's Prayer somewhere along the line. Most of us have uh, at least heard of it. Uh, many of us know that. We learned it in catechism. Uh, maybe you learned it in confirmation class. Or you learned it, um, you know, just in kids' church or something. But like a lot of principles, a lot of truths in the Bible, it, become, it can become really routine where we recite it just because we know it. <clears throat> Um, or we make that the essence of our prayer time. We shoot up a quick, uh, you know, uh, Lord's Prayer and, and uh, think that that becomes our prayer time. I grew up in a particular church tradition where it was um, nobody, nobody said this, nobody certainly taught this, but what I, my takeaway was the Lord's Prayer was kind of vaguely like uh, a prescription, <laughs> Kind of like, hey, say five of these and see me in the morning, okay? You'll, you'll feel better, trust me. Um, however you learned it, most of us are familiar with the, the version. Go ahead and put that up, uh, the version that uh, was recited there in the, the video. Um, this comes from Matthew chapter 6 and uh, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is addressing a crowd. And that's usually the version in some form or fashion that most of us are used to. But in preparing for this message and praying, and I, I went through all of the Gospels, and I read the entirety of Jesus' teaching on prayer, and I just said, Lord, what, what do you want to say about prayer? What do you want us to know about prayer? And in the course of doing that, I ran into something that I'm sure I've read before, but I never stopped and thought about, which is easy to do with the Bible. Um, and that is the version from the Gospel of Luke. So here's the beginning of what Luke says. He says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. My first thought was, well, there's a uh, slight implication there, a thought that maybe, you know, hey, John's disciples are getting something, Jesus, that, that you're not giving to us. Like, we want the good stuff. We want whatever they have. But I started thinking about that more, and I started praying about that more, and I wondered, so what is it that John taught his disciples? Because maybe uh, there's something else there that we've been missing all along. So I started tracking that down and studying and looking up lots of things. And if you're inclined to chase that down, let me help you. Don't bother. Don't waste your time. Um, what you'll find is it kind of goes nowhere. Um, there's definitely nothing biblically that talks about what John taught his disciples regarding prayer. And the extra biblical sources are you know, kind of people's ideas, and so don't bother. Uh, so I thought, well, okay, well, Lord, so I'm on the wrong track here. But then, then uh, he stopped me, and um, 
uh, my next thought was, no, this is the exact right track because the point is not what John taught his disciples. The point is Jesus' response to the question about what John taught his disciples. And so that's what we want to talk about today. Whereas this Sermon on the Mount was for the crowd, the version here in Luke, this teaching is for the disciples. And so scholars differ whether these are two separate occasions. You can imagine there's something as, as important as how to pray. You could easily imagine that Jesus was asked that more than once. Um, so some scholars think this is the same occasion, different version, something is different. Regardless, here's what Luke writes about the Lord's Prayer. He, Jesus, said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation." Well, whatever's going on there, we know he's not suggesting uh, that there's some sort of a formula that we pray or, or a prescription. If you pray this, then this will happen, so do it this way. We know that's, that's not anything that's, uh, that's happening here. But it's interesting what Jesus does do as he tells his disciples how to pray. And I want to dig into that because there's a backstory, a pretty fascinating backstory that Jesus uses here. So Jesus takes the traditional prayer that would have been familiar to everybody in the crowd in the Sermon on the Mount. He takes this same traditional story that would have been familiar to the disciples because they're all good, faithful Jews. He takes his traditional prayer known as Kaddish and he kind of turns it around and does something with it, okay? So this prayer known as Kaddish is a traditional Jewish prayer, and there's many forms of that, but the most uh, common being the mourner's Kaddish. That's a, a prayer that is said uh, on the occasion of somebody's death, and so they recite Kaddish. And go to that next slide. Well, yeah, here's how it starts out. It says, may the great name of God be exalted and sanctified throughout the world which he has created according to his will. May his kingship be established in your lifetime and in your days and in the lifetime of the entire household of Israel swiftly and in the near future and say amen. And there's about two more uh, paragraphs of this. Same, you get the gist. Um, you get the idea. It's all pointed at God as if life is simply me and him and there's nobody else here. And when my wife was in Teen Challenge and I was far, far from God, I went to Teen Challenge because there was a special speaker, Will McFarlane uh, came, a uh, guy came from Alabama, but he came, he was a special speaker and I was not interested in the things of God at all. I was there because our little three-year-old, I thought it'd be nice if she saw her mom. That's why I was there. And this guy said something, I don't know why this, this resonated with me, he said, you know, um, there's this saying, he said, you know, we have this idea that the Christian life is just me and God, kind of like me and God walking down the beaches of life, you know, footprints in the sand, whatever. And he said, that's not the Christian life. The Christian life is you and me and God. And for whatever reason, that resonated with me. And that didn't turn me to the Lord, but I remember that afterwards. And I remember that all these years later, you know, 32 years later. So um, there's this kind of idea in this prayer that it's just me and Jesus, and that's, that's about it, okay? But Jesus does a couple things here. First, what he's doing with Kaddish, he's taking this traditional prayer that they all knew, and he's beginning to point to himself as the fulfillment for this prayer. Here's what a, uh, a pastor, an author says, Stephen Miller. He says, um, yep, thank you. Go to the next one. He says, hidden within the opening lines of the Lord's Prayer, it seems, is a clue that God has already started to answer the prayer. The Messiah has come in your lifetime, and he has brought with him the good news of how to find salvation and become citizens of God's kingdom. So that's the backstory on this uh, Lord's Prayer. But here's the second thing that Jesus does, and and. You see it clearly. As soon as I tell you, you're going to go, yep, I see that. He expands the basic duties of life beyond just this, and now it's this. So it's not just me and Jesus. Now it's you and me and Jesus. And that's what he's doing. He's beginning to define the Christian life as reaching out to others. That's the backstory of that. But it's not the first time he does that, actually. If you walk through the Gospels, you see Jesus being revolutionary in a lot of ways. Some of them are pretty, pretty obvious. Some of them are real subtle. 
like this one. Uh, he borrows another pr traditional prayer known as Shema. Uh, go to that next slide. Yeah, that starts out with, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He, he takes a line from that, that general thought, which is all vertical, and he marries it to Leviticus 19, which is love your neighbor, it's horizontal, so that when the occasion arises and a certain scribe comes to him and says, teacher, what's the most important commandment? Next slide, please. Jesus responds with this, love the Lord your God vertically, and the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself horizontally. And so that's what Jesus is doing when his disciples say, hey, teach us how to pray. Okay, I'll teach you how to pray. Praying starts here, but then we pray out here too. Well, with this whole vertical, horizontal dynamic in mind, we think about how revolutionary every part of the Lord's prayer is. If we go to the next slide. First of all, he's saying, hey, God isn't just some ethereal kind of Casper the ghost thing floating around up here. In the he's right here. He's our Father who's in heaven, but he's our Father. His name is to be exalted on all the earth, and his reign here displaces all other lords or all other uh, gods or you know, whatever you want to uh, define that as. Second thing he does is this. He says, praying for bread reminds, of his, it reminds us of, of Israel's experience when God provided for them in the desert just enough manna for every day. And his specific direction was, don't save it up for the next day because you won't like what happens to it. You won't want to eat it. It'll be bad. I'll take care of you every single day. And that produces trust in God, not in my ability to accumulate things. Now, there is biblical teaching um, and truth that we're to plan, we're to save, we're to invest wisely. But all that is over here. Accumulation is over here. Accumulation is based upon, uh, can be based upon greed or fear. I'm accumulating. Saving and investing is not based upon fear. It's based upon wisdom. It's based upon God's truth. Next slide. He says, pr uh, praying to be released from debt and releasing others demonstrates the principle of jubilee. Every 50 years, according to Jewish law, we kind of hit reset. Everybody's off the hook. All of your debts are forgiven. You forgive my debts, and we get to start over. And this overcomes a lifestyle based on accumulation of debt because I know that on the 50th year, we're going to hit a reset here. And so for that reason, we release others from sin. Now, I don't have to wait 50 years to forgive you. Uh, I can do it right now. And you don't have to wait 50 years to forgive somebody else. You can be done with that right now and be free in your heart uh, from dragging that around with you, okay? And then the final slide on this is praying not to be tempted and to be delivered from evil humbly portrays our human condition. One of my favorite prayers I read in a book uh, many years ago, this book written around the 1500s called... Uh, um, yeah, I forget what it's called. Anyway, um, <laughs> totally slips in my mind right now. Um, the, uh, the Way of the Pilgrim. The Way of the Pilgrim. This is a, 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 a Christian who walked his way across Russia, stopping at every little monastery and asking the fathers in these, these places, how do I pray? And he came away with this prayer. His prayer was, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's what he prayed all day long walking across Russia, which just sounds terrible, doesn't it? Um, but that's part of the Lord's prayer is an acknowledgement, Lord Jesus Christ, you're the Son of God. Have mercy on me, a sinner, and I need a Savior. Well, if we go back to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus moves into a discussion about boldness and persistence in prayer and I'm not really going to camp in there. But then he makes an interesting contrast between earthly fathers and our heavenly father. And he says this. He says that um, you, earthly fathers, us, earthly fathers, even though we're imperfect in a lot of ways, we still have the ability and the wherewithal to give good kids uh, good things to our kids. How much more than now it gets interesting because he has a different, a slightly different response in Matthew and in Luke. So go to Matthew, to the next slide. But how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Remember that. Now Luke, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? 
Yeah, and I saw that and I went, okay, that's not by mistake. What do you want to say here? What, what, what's the deal? What gives, Lord? Um, I didn't know. I had to go out for a walk. Like, I'm an early morning walker. So I went out for a walk and just said, what's the gig, Lord? I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. Here's what uh, I think he's saying. He's saying, uh, first of all, um, from a human perspective, we could look at this and go, hang on. I thought we were praying through the Lord's Prayer. I thought we were praying about your naming being hallowed, um, forgiving other people, meeting our needs. And now we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Like, um, and I'll just say that from a human perspective, God, I was praying for um, a financial need that we have. I was praying for uh, a physical need, some healing. I've been praying for, you know, a relationship or some people to get saved. And you're talking about the Holy Spirit? I mean, no offense, Lord, but that's not really what I'm looking for. I'm kind of looking for something measurable, something tangible. Um, somebody, uh, uh, a report from a doctor or some financial um, relief or something like that, you know. Um, in other words, I don't really need a religious, uh, spiritual, intangible response I need actual money in the bank. I need actual healing in my body. I need this person uh, who doesn't know the Lord uh, or they know him but they're, they're struggling. I need that person. We need that person to be connected with you. Um, thanks for the Holy Spirit, but you know we, we really need something tangible here. Well, remember this. James says on the next slide, James says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. And that's the beauty, I think, of Jesus' response here in the Gospel of Luke. When we ask for healing, you do get healing. You might get it in this life. You might get it in the next one. But when you ask for healing, you get healing. You also get the healer. And when you ask for direction, Lord, I need direction, you get direction. Some God may send somebody to you to help you. Um, he may download it through his spirit. But you, you get direction. You also get, as he refers to the spirit in, in the Gospel of John, you also get the counselor who he tells the disciples will live in you, which had to blow their minds. You know, when you need uh, financial help, you get the financial help. You also get him. You get his presence. See, God could simply dispense answer to prayer all day long, kind of shoot it out like a Pez dispenser. He, he could answer your prayer like that. He could answer my prayer without any problem whatsoever. But he wants us, he wants you, he wants me to pursue something that's unpredictable uh, can't be quantified, can't be measured necessarily, and that's his presence in our lives. And yes, he does want to answer your prayers uh, in a material way. But more than that, and he will, but more than that, he wants this connection, this vertical connection to be intact. Now, I said that he wants to do something that's unquantifiable, unmeasurable. Now, if you're a control junkie, any control junkies? Or it's just me today. Okay, I'll talk to me. If you're a control junkie, uh, that's going to be tough. That's going to be tough to say, Lord, I release this to you, and I'm keeping it released to you, whatever it might be, whatever the situation or circumstance might be. I release it to you in your way and in your time. It's going to require trust. So the disciples do get their answer. They, they do get to learn how to pray. Jesus tells them. The other thing they get in the process is they get this personal, intimate, one-on-one -on -one uh, interaction with Jesus. So he does answer their prayer. I, yes, I will teach you how to pray. And in the process, you're going to get time with me because I'm going to teach you all kinds of things. So here's the takeaway. Whatever the details of your prayers might be, the crucial thing is not to get hung up on your expectations. We have some good friends, and uh, many years ago, his catchphrase was, um, I mean, we just go out and have dinner. You know, we go out and have pizza or something. And on the way home, he would say, we'd say, hey, did you have so-and-so? Did you have fun? Did you have a good time tonight? And he'd say, that didn't quite meet my expectations. I mean, seeing as how he spent the evening with me, I understand what he's saying. But you're talking about the pizza, you're talking about, you know, but everything was expectations. That was kind of a joke, and we all laughed about it. But we get um, our expectations about 
when and how God's going to answer our prayer. I do. I do. I've, I've, I've got most of it mapped out in my head. How and why. And this would be really clean, Lord, if you just, you know, fulfilled my order that I'm submitting to you. Okay? But um, we would be really happy, some of us, if God would just answer our prayers. But as I said, God could, you know, dispense that all day long, but he wants us to pursue him. So the takeaway is this. Most of us would be happy if he just answered. I'd be totally satisfied. Man, how's your walk with God? It's awesome, man. He hears me and he answers my prayers just the way I want, when I want. This, this Christian life is a, is a trip. I should have done this a long time ago. We know that's not how it works because you could get the answer. I could get the answers to every one of those prayers just the way I want them, but miss something very important, and I would miss this. I would miss this connection with him that I can't define to you. I can't measure it. I, sometimes I can't even explain it. I just know. I, I mentioned before from up here several years ago when I was a brand new Christian, somebody where I worked said, um, hey, how do you know? You're, so you're like religious now or whatever. How do you know all this, this stuff? He said, crap, but um, we're in church, so I can't say that. Um, all this stuff is real. And I said, I said to him, um, the Bible says God's spirit bears witness with our spirit. That's how we know we're sons of God. And he went, huh, and he walked away. And I stood there for a second, and I thought, yeah, I don't know. I just read that in the Bible. I don't know what that means, but I do. His spirit bears with you. just know that you know there's a connection. Here's what we would miss if all we, God did was just answer our prayers. Go to the next slide. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. You would miss out on the intimacy of connection with Jesus if all he did was give you everything you wanted like Santa Claus. Here's what Oswald Chambers says about that. Spiritual lust, you know what, lust is an out-of-balance desire, whether it's for sex or money or power or recognition, whatever it is. Spiritual lust causes me to demand an answer from God instead of seeking God himself who gives the answer. The purpose of prayer is that we get hold of God, not the answer. Amen. I'm going to shift gears for just a second. I want to talk to the men. But ladies, you can listen too. I want to talk to the men. So we just finished this teaching series uh, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, on authentic manhood. And we talked about a lot of good things, got a lot of good uh, feedback on that. I want to ask you some questions. Just answer these silently to yourself. Would you like to hear from God? Just know that you know, man, I heard from God. When I was a brand new Christian, it occurred to me that Man, I just heard from God. That just blew my mind. I cannot believe that I heard from God. A heathen reprobate like me heard God's voice. Crazy. Would you like that? Would you like a better marriage, better connection with your kids to succeed at work, your job or your career, just to have some success there? Would you like to be respected by others, just kind of leveled out emotionally? If your emotions are, you know, kind of up and down all the time, just kind of cut those highs off and cut those lows off and just, just have a narrow, narrower range of emotion. Would you like to be leveled out? How about replace a nagging habit or a stronghold with freedom? Any of that resonate with you? you where you'd say to yourself, yeah, I'd like to have that. I want to ask you men to do something. Now, this is outside the norm, okay, and I promise it'll only last a few seconds, and you don't have to do it if you don't want. Ladies, you can join us too. I just want to ask you to raise your hands. Outstanding, yeah. That said, doesn't hurt, does it? Just raise your hands. Go to the next slide. I want the men everywhere, Paul tells Timothy, lifting up holy hands in prayer toward heaven. You can put your hands down. Thank you. And the psalmist says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol. And the key word there is the word lift or lifting or lifted. So if you answered yes to anything's on that list, that previous slide that you would like to have in your life, here's the best thing you can do, men and women, but I'm talking to the men right now. The best thing you can do is let your kids see you worship. 
If you got real little kids, like when our kids were, were real small, I'd grab them during worship at church and hold them right here so they could feel me worshiping. I wanted like, to transfer that right into them. Let them feel you. Let them hear you. Let them see you worship. Let them know that you read the Bible. And I'm not talking about putting on a show. Don't, don't do that. You wouldn't probably do that anyway. But let them know you read the Bible. God's word is important to you. Let them hear you praise. Let them hear you and see you apologize when you blow it. Anybody ever had to do that? No, it's just me. Okay. Um, when you say something stupid to their mom. When you say something you shouldn't have said to one of them or to somebody else. Let them see you, hear you, make that right, and ask forgiveness. So think about what you tend to lift up. Do you tend to lift up your heart, your hands, your affections, your emotions, your worship to God? Or is the theme of your life more that you're lifting yourself, your soul, to idols? hobbies, personal thoughts, personal motivations or agendas, you know, obsessions, fantasies, work, money, whatever it might be. What's the, the predominant pattern in your life? Your kids know what the predominant pattern is, and your wife knows the predominant pattern. And the remedy for that is lifting yourself to the Lord. Let me take this a step further. Diane and I were just talking about this last night when we were uh, out walking, and um, she said something that, that made me think, you know, if we don't do this for the men, if we don't do this, if we don't worship and engage and be in God's word and make things right with others and pursue him, you know what kids will learn? They'll learn that that's a feminine activity. Those are feminine things. Because my dad doesn't do that, but my mom does. So do with that what you will, okay? Or they'll conclude that it's, it's for women, or they'll conclude oh, that's for soft men. That's for, for weak men. They're the ones who worship and engage with the Holy Spirit. Well, James says this, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, powerful and effective. So far, we've talked about prayer in terms of speaking to God, but as Ben mentioned, prayer is also just listening, just sitting still and listening. And he uh, mentioned 1 Samuel 3, Samuel saying to the Lord, speak for your servant is listening. Just here I am, Lord, what do you, what do you want to say? And maybe the Lord doesn't want to say a thing. Maybe he just wants you to sit. I've got a, uh, um, my Wednesday night small group kind of cocked their heads when I said this, but I think they're going to be okay. Uh, I said, I've got a pipe tobacco candle that I light sometimes in my time with the Lord. It's not a pipe. It's okay. It's a pipe tobacco candle. And I light this candle. It smells like your grandpa sitting there smoking a pipe. And I, and I light that thing, and I just say, yeah, bring it. Here we are, Lord. What, what do you want to do? Or go for a walk at some early, early hour. Just you and me, Lord. What, what is it? Sometimes it's nothing. I don't hear, it's not nothing. I don't hear anything particular. But it's time with him. Andrew Murray is a classic uh, writer of Christian literature. He says, prayer is not monologue, but dialogue. God's voice is its most essential part. Listening to God's voice is the secret of the assurance that he will listen to mine. So let me come back to James real quick. So what is the powerful and effective result of prayer? The powerful, effective prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. The first thing it accomplishes is right here in you. Yes, it will accomplish uh, what somebody else needs or what you need, whatever the, the particular need might be. But the first thing that happens is right here in our hearts. That's vertically, he and I connecting over and over and over again. That plays out in relationships horizontally. Bob Sorge is a guy I've mentioned before. He says this in his book, Secrets of the Secret Place. Prayer is the constant calibration of the soul. Prayer is the constant realignment, recalibration of the soul. The mind, what you think with. The will, what you choose with. The emotions, what you feel with. Constant calibration of the soul. I put the QR code on there. If you want to read that book, that's a great way to get it. I know uh, 
wherever they are. Michael and Abigail have spent some time in that book. Uh, somebody gave that to me at a Teen Challenge conference, and I tossed it aside because it was all this free junk they handed out. And I finally read it, and I went, wow, you're really dumb. You should have read this like a year ago. Prayer is the constant calibration of the soul over and over and over again, being realigned, making sure we stay in alignment with him. But here's the deal. You can't calibrate. You can't adjust when you're on the run all the time. And so if you have uh, uh, some prayer time on your way to work or you've got a five-minute devotional every day, hey, that's good, but that's not going to produce depth of intimacy. That's not going to produce depth of of maturity in your Christian life. Here's a, I'll just put it in terms we can all understand. Uh, if we, um, we can't engage in spiritual intercourse when we're distracted. Can't engage with intercourse with God when we're distracted. Or I'm on the run, or I'm driving to work, or I got a five minute thing, you know. Keep doing those things, but make sure you have time to sit with him. We need to be stop, to stop and be purposeful about connecting with him. Weston, you want to come on up? So one of the results of praying on the fly like that, just kind of shooting prayers out, is it becomes just kind of like that. And the prayer tends to be horizontal. I just, on my way to work, I'm shooting out prayer for this person and that person and this need and that need. And I lose connection with this vertical aspect where I just worship, I just praise him. In other words, I only have time to, uh, as, as the phrase would go, I only have time to shoot up a quick one to the big guy. And so um, my prayers become primarily horizontal. I have a good friend in Omaha who was a mentor of mine for many years spent many years as a Catholic priest and just kind of in a secluded environment monastery. And he says this, he says, he says, I honestly cannot think of one thing to ask Father for that he has not already covered. I'm like, John, what, so what's your prayer life? He's like, I don't ask for anything. I just know Father's already got it covered. Like, at first I thought, oh, that's, come on, John. But uh, the more I thought about that over the years, I thought, yeah, he has outrageous confidence that whatever it is, God's already covered it. Now, I still think it's appropriate and biblical to lift those prayers up, but I appreciate the motivation. I know that God already has it all covered. And so God needs to be worshiped and pray. My heart, your heart needs you to worship and praise him, sometimes without asking for a thing. Lord, I'm just here to say thanks. Thank you. That, that's it. That's all I can do is say thank you sometimes. Well, as a wrap up, if your prayer life is described as, you know, kind of on the run or shooting up one uh, every now and then, or it's primarily uh, horizontal, I'm just making sure all my friends and family members are covered in prayer, but I never take time or I don't uh, take purposeful time to worship him, then that'd be something to think about today. Men and women, think about what you tend to lift your soul to. As I said earlier, hobbies, work, whatever it might be, sex, money, you name it. What's the predominant pattern of your life? What do you lift your time and your energies to most of all? And then finally, just make that time to listen. Just sit and listen. Go for a walk or do whatever your space is. Uh, to listen. Some people go out fishing and they just listen to the Lord. 